Good morning, Citadel Square. My name is Steve. If you're new, uh, one of the pastors here, if you got a Bible, why don't you go ahead and grab it and turn to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Uh, we've closed the, the door on the ministry of John the Baptist. Aren't you glad those messages are over? Whew, gosh. Uh, we looked at John the Baptist preaching a baptism of repentance as the forerunner of the Messiah. And we ended last week with uh, the observation that John's ministry was brought to a halt by King Herod, by the political rulers of the day. So in a sense, what Luke does for us is he uh, begins to close the chapter on John's ministry, we now open up to the ministry of Jesus Christ, uh, which is where we're going to be today. We're going to be in Luke chapter 3, verses uh, 21 to 38. And if you look at, if you just kind of look at that text in front of you, you go, well, there's two verses, Steve, to preach, but 23 through 38 is a whole bunch of names. What are you going to do with that? You hang tight. We'll be done by 1.30, I promise. <laughs> Uh, let me, you know, I'll, I'll say this, uh, it, let me encourage you, since you're here today and you can tell your friends, next week uh, we're going to slow down the narrative of Luke and we're going to look at uh, the temptation of Jesus Christ. And we're going to take three weeks to look at those temptations. And I'm going to do that for a particular reason that you'll understand as we get to the end of our time here today. Uh, but what we're going to look at to begin with really are two pieces, two blocks of material that Luke, for some reason, puts right next to each other. Uh, he, the other gospel writers don't do what Luke does here. Uh, Luke is very unique in the way that he treats Jesus' baptism and Jesus' genealogy. Both of which are gonna, we're going to look at here today. And for some reason, Luke, in the way he arranges his material, has waited to talk about the genealogy of Jesus Christ till chapter 3. If you uh, know the book of Matthew, Matthew begins with the genealogy right out the gate. He starts with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Well, Luke, for some reason, has waited in this story until right here. And he's waited particularly to put it next to the event known as Jesus' baptism, which all four gospel writers include. It's a very significant moment in the ministry of Jesus Christ as the, uh, the curtains close on John the Baptist ministry, the curtains open on Jesus Christ's ministry. And Jesus has been in a uh, relative obscurity for, uh, well, since we've seen him uh, and when he was 12, for the last 18 years. And the baptism of Jesus Christ begins, effectively cuts the tape on Jesus beginning his public ministry in Revelation to Israel. Uh, if you know over in the book of John, John captures for us this phrase or this statement that John the Baptist makes about Jesus. Here's what he says over in John 1 verse 31. John says, I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. So even John in his own ministry recognizes he didn't know who Jesus was. He didn't have some inside track on this cousin of his that just so happens to be the Messiah, the Son of God. He didn't know, but he knew he had to obey by being the forerunner. And as he participated and executed the ministry that he was called to, being filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb, and now on the scene preaching a baptism of repentance, he knew that his ministry would end with the revelation of Jesus Christ. We don't know how long John baptized, but we know in the conclusion of his ministry, Christ is revealed. So this is a point of, of revelation for us. It's a significant point in Luke's gospel as we see now who Jesus is and what he's about to do to begin his public ministry. Uh, so what we're going to do, as we said last week, we, we saw the close of John's ministry in Herod imprisoning him. What we're going to do is rewind and Luke is going to take us back into John's ministry and show us this moment. Luke isn't going to talk about the conversation uh, and the kind of the consternation that John has. In fact, Luke, when he recounts the baptism of Jesus Christ, is the shortest of all accounts. Second only to Mark, who takes three verses, Luke takes two, to mention perhaps the most significant beginning moment of Jesus' ministry. So all through the beginning of Luke's gospel, we have been dealing with somewhat of an unspoken tension that you're going to see come to the front right here in Luke's uh, writing. We have been dealing since Gabriel announced this to Mary. If you remember what Gabriel said back in Luke 1, let me just read it to you. You don't need to turn there. 
He says that uh, in talking to Mary, speaking of Jesus, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. So we've, we heard in Gabriel's announcement that this is the Son of God. And then if you remember the tension we saw about Jesus as the middle schooler, that Jesus is talking to his parents, and his parents said, Son, we're filled with anxiety. Where were you? Why did you do this to us? And Jesus' response, if you remember, was, Well, didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? So up to this point, we've been dealing with sort of a growing recognition and realization, or maybe a better to say, a growing question. Well, who is the Son of God? What really does that mean as Jesus enters into humanity, as Jesus begins to take on the mantle of the ministry that God has assigned for him? What does it mean for Jesus to be the Son of God? And to, not to give away too much next week, but the very first temptation that Satan gives is over the fact and over the question, if you are the Son of God, then. So what controls the next few paragraphs of Luke's narrative is how Jesus is the Son of God. You'll see it in the baptism, you'll see it in the genealogy, and then you're going to see it in the temptations. And I'll show you how that works uh, in the temptations when we look at next week. But this week, just the baptism and the genealogy. You with me so far? Great. Don't worry about it. Let's pray. Father, we're going to pause just for a minute and ask for your grace to understand things about your word perhaps that we've never seen before. As we prepare our hearts to partake of the Lord's Supper and to remember what Christ has done for us, I pray that we would get a new appreciation for who he is in these few verses that we look at. That maybe we would be reminded of something that is clear in the scriptures that we have forgotten or hadn't heard before that we gain great comfort and great insight to know who you want us to see Jesus is. So, Father, we pause and, and just for a minute ask for your word to fall on good soil, to produce fruit that lasts, fruit that remains, and that we would honor you with our worship of the Son of God, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, look at three... 21 with me. You're going to see Luke prove that Jesus is the Son of God by two different, uh, kind of in two different ways. One through his baptism and one through his genealogy. Luke 3 verse 21. Now when all the people were baptized. Now we know from John's ministry that he didn't baptize everyone. There were people who refused to be baptized or got baptized in the wrong way. But it seems as we come to the close of John's ministry, Luke wants us to know that this final baptism that John is about to exercise, John is about to do with Jesus in the Jordan River, seems to be the culmination of his ministry. It seems to sum up everything that John was called to do. He preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He's continuing to prepare people to meet God, to remove the spiritual obstacles that stand between them and a right relationship with God. And now Jesus Christ arrives on the scene. And now as everybody has been baptized, it seems that Jesus arrives and steps down into the water with the repentant sinners. And as I said, Luke doesn't give us any of that conversation. If you've read some of the other gospel accounts, you know that John has a real hard time with this. John goes, wait a minute, I need to be baptized by you. Why in the world do you come to me for baptism? And Jesus says, well, this, let this be now be done to fulfill all righteousness. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but suffice it to say that Jesus now does what repentant sinners do. He steps into the water with the repentant sinners. And the culmination of John's ministry, Jesus gets baptized. See, John knows as he begins his, his ministry as the forerunner that his ministry has an end date. Would you agree? John knows, I'm just here for a little bit to exercise the ministry that God has called me to. Even when you look in John, after Jesus is baptized, the very next day after John baptized Jesus, John turns to his disciples and says, behold the Lamb of God. And now his disciples start to move from following John, now to following Jesus. 
So it's interesting just in considering John and his ministry calling that John's ministry is done when people meet Jesus, right? Isn't that an interesting observation to make that John knows he comes on the scene in a very weird way, in a very weird place to do a very kind of central, significant, nuclear reactor kind of ministry, but he also knows at the very same time that his ministry is going to get shut off. Isn't that great to know that a lot of our ministry responsibility can find its fulfillment in the recognition that we are helping people meet the creator, that we are helping people meet Jesus. We're not pointing to ourselves. It would be so weird for John to baptize Jesus and then go, hey, everybody, wasn't that great? <laughs> didn't, my, didn't my ministry really do what it was supposed to do? John, reckon, John knows the baton has been handed. The Lamb of God is here. He must increase. I must decrease. So John knows. He's on the scene. We don't know how long John baptizes, but we know it's not for long once Jesus arrives, right? He knows that he's got to begin it. Jesus has to arrive, and John needs to fall off the scene so that Jesus would be preeminent in the minds and hearts of people. So, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized, uh, and was praying... So, because Luke doesn't focus on the consternation and conversation between Jesus and John, Luke does something else that's only recorded here. Only Luke records the fact that Jesus was praying after he was baptized, which is interesting. Because as we step into understanding who Jesus Christ is, one of the things that you're going to see about Jesus, really as the result of this entire sermon, is the fact that Jesus is essentially human. Jesus has to partake in the same kind of spiritual disciplines that you and I have. What was he doing when he was 12? He was learning the word of God. Did you have to open your Bible for the first time? You remember opening your Bible for the first time and reading what God's word said, understanding who God is, understanding who Jesus is, understanding, man, God has an opinion about life, money, marriage, sexuality, immorality, justice, all sorts of stuff, right? God has opinions on that stuff. And what you see in Jesus' life as a human is that Jesus now has to engage his heavenly father through prayer. And this will be be consistent throughout Jesus' time. Mark says that Jesus often withdrew early in the morning to pray. When Jesus gets ready to pick the 12 disciples, what does he do? He spends all night in prayer. When Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, what is he doing? He's praying. When Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus responds saying, I thank you, Lord, Father of heaven and earth, that you have revealed this thing to babes. He responds in prayer. Which is helpful for us as Christians to know that if Jesus needs to, don't we need to? Amen? It shows us that Jesus in his essential humanity as the perfect man still needs to spend time in dialogue and conversation with his heavenly father. That's what prayer is. Prayer is not merely conversation where you shout at needs at God, right? I mean, I know we all do that and that's kind of the default. But prayer is meant to be this intimate relational development with our heavenly father. Jesus puts that on display for us. If Jesus is characterized by prayer, if Jesus is praying and then his disciples come to him and go, would you teach us to pray like John taught his disciples to pray? Then it seems that Jesus understands that prayer is central to his ministry. It's central not only to his ministry. Don't, let's not reduce it merely to a ministry opportunity, but, central, but prayer is central to our personal relationship with our Heavenly Father, right? It's central in the way we speak to God and make our requests known to God. And for some reason, Luke pauses in this narrative as Jesus is in the Jordan with repentant sinners and now acknowledging that as he's about to step on the scene into the ministry that God has for him, he's praying. He's 
asking. We don't know what he's praying for necessarily, but we know that he's in dialogue with heaven. And it seems as, as you look at this passage that praying is now going to open up three particular things that happen in response to Jesus' prayers. Jesus is baptized. Jesus begins praying. And then you're going to see three things happen. Here's what they are. The heavens are going to be open. The spirit is going to descend. And a voice is going to speak. Okay? Heavens open. Spirit descends. Voice is going to speak. Let's watch. So he's praying. Here's the remainder of the verse. Jesus had been baptized and was praying. The heavens were open. Now, when the heavens are open, you know, uh, over in Acts, when Luke writes Acts, he talks about the stoning of Stephen. And when Stephen is stoned, it says the heavens are open and Stephen sees the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the throne of power. So, I would argue that when the heavens are open, you know, heavens get opened in Revelation. Heavens get opened when Stephen dies. The heavens get opened when Ezekiel receives his first visions in Ezekiel chapter 1. Would you agree that when the heavens open, heaven has something to say? I think we, let's, if nothing else, the spiritual realm has something to say about what's happening down here. So here's Jesus obeying, getting baptized, praying, and now as the heavens open, there's about to be conversation. There's about to be something important that those who are observing this scene, those of us who are in this room reading this scene, ought to understand about what Jesus has done and what Jesus is doing. Now, what you're going to find in this passage is that the entire Trinity is going to be involved. The whole Godhead is going to be involved right here in the divine commissioning and uh, recognition of Jesus as the Son of God. So, as the heavens open, here's the, you have the Son of God in the water. Number two, you have the Spirit of God in verse 22. Verse 22, the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. Now, the Holy Spirit has been a significant player in the beginning of Luke's narrative, Right? From the beginning, we had John filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. From the beginning, in Gabriel's message to Mary, he said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, therefore the child that will be born to you will be holy. The Holy Spirit is in the mouth of Zechariah. The Holy Spirit is in the mouth of Elizabeth. The Holy Spirit is in the mouth and in the leadership of Simeon, bringing Simeon to the temple to observe the things that are happening as the Son of God arrives in the temple with his parents. So the Holy Spirit has been a significant player up to this point in helping us recognize what God is doing. And now at this moment, the Holy Spirit itself descends from heaven and rests on Jesus in bodily form. Whether it looked like a dove, it floated gracefully like a dove, whether it was a bird or not a bird, it was some visible appearing of the Spirit of God such that Luke and the people there could understand that heaven had something to say and the Holy Spirit now descends and empowers and identifies itself with the Son of God. One commentator said that the Holy Spirit floats down gracefully as a dove. It may be that, but we don't know exactly. We have a simile that just says it's like a dove. What we saw, we're not sure. But the Holy Spirit comes down and descends upon Christ as a dove. Now, if we agree that Jesus has to pray, I think we could also agree from this passage that Jesus has to walk in the Spirit just like you and just like me. Right? So much so, one commentator said that Jesus walked in the Spirit so much so that by the time you get to the point, like in Matthew 12, where the Pharisees and Sadducees are so mad at Jesus for what he is doing that they say, you must be inhabited by Satan. And Jesus said, you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So here's Jesus, the essential human, having to pray, having to to be filled with the Spirit. I had this conversation with one of my seminary professors and I, I asked this question. I said, now, as Jesus was on the earth and he was fully God and fully man, would it be fair to say that Jesus had to do some things in faith? And I was rebuked almost immediately because he said everything Jesus did during his time as a human on this earth was done by faith. He is so connected to heaven so in tune with what the Spirit of God wants him to do 
that he always is walking in the power of the Spirit. He's always in concert. When Jesus talks about this in John chapter 8, he says, I always do what is pleasing to the Father. So when you look at Jesus, who Colossians calls the fullness of deity in bodily form, what you are seeing in Jesus' activity on this earth during his time when in his public ministry, all of heaven agrees with what this man is doing. All of heaven agrees with what this man says. All of his ministry is done in dependence and faith and reliance upon the very power of heaven. Just like our Christian lives have to be. We have to pray and walk by the Spirit, right? So Jesus is no different. And Luke makes sure we know that as he begins his ministry, he's beginning it as a human who's reliant on the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, here's your third one. Heaven's open. The Spirit descends. Number three, you got a voice from heaven. And by reason of elimination, you got the Son of God, you got the Spirit. Who do you got here? You got the Father. You got the Father speaking. Now the Father speaks and he gives us information about who this person is. Now, if you have a cross reference here in three, uh, what verse are we on? 322. Do you have a, you have a couple of cross references? Do you have Psalm 2? Okay, thank you. One of you has Psalm 2. That's fine. You can right now write down a cross-reference of your own in your Bible. You've got two pieces here, Psalm 2, and you probably have Isaiah 42. I want to show you these real quick, because when the voice from heaven speaks, it says something that is an earthquake. It says something that carries resonance all the way back into the Old Testament. The first one, and the first statement that the voice says is this. You are my beloved son. Now that comes from Psalm chapter 2. If you turn back to Psalm chapter 2 with me, just to look at one verse briefly. Psalm chapter 2 is an invasion. It's a, it's a wartime psalm between the nations of the earth and the Messiah as anointed by God. So when the voice from heaven shows up, In Jesus' day, after his baptism, as he's praying and the Holy Spirit is descending, what you're seeing is God's opinion of this individual who is in the water and completely dependent on uh, the Holy Spirit and his power. You're seeing the voice from heaven give us a divine appointment and identification of who this person is. Look at Psalm 2, verse 7. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son, Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them. I'm sorry, break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now when you move to the New Testament, there are at least three different places. Romans 1, Hebrews 1, and Acts 13 that all talk about Jesus being declared the Son of God as a result, not of his obedience or of his Old Testament appointment, but really because of his resurrection. So when you get into the New Testament, Romans says he was declared to be the Son of God according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Hebrews makes that point as well. Acts 13 makes that point as well. So at the beginning of his ministry, as he gets ready to step into what God is calling him to do, he's called the Son. When the New Testament writers talk about it, they look back on his ministry and his ministry of resurrection, and they said, he's the Son. You with me so far? So it's a regal title. In Psalm chapter 2, it's the Lord's anointed versus the nations. Do you see that? All the nations, if you read Psalm 2, say, we hate the Lord's anointed. And God in heaven laughs, and he still appoints him the Son. Now, the second thing that the voice says shows up in Isaiah 42. So turn to Isaiah 42 with me. Turn to your right. Now, we've already seen something from Isaiah, haven't we? We've already seen that Isaiah 40 begins the ministry of the forerunner of John the Baptist. Well, Isaiah 42 introduces us to somebody who's called the servant that will carry that theme from Isaiah 42 into the servant songs of Isaiah uh, 53, some of the most well-known spots in Isaiah. 
So the first thing that the voice says is that you are my beloved son. The second thing that the voice says is that with you, I'm well pleased. Well, that echo of Old Testament comes in Isaiah 42. Look at Isaiah 42, verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. So while Psalm 2 talks about the incarnate Messiah, God's anointed king who will rule the nations with a rod of iron, Isaiah 42 gives us a different picture of this person. This person is viewed as completely submissive to God's will, completely dependent on God empowering his ministry through the Spirit, and being in complete concert with the will and the desires of heaven itself. What we look at is not so much his regal authority from Psalm 2, but we look at his heart in Isaiah 42. We look at his, his willingness to obey and to submit and to do everything that God wanted him to do all the way up to the point of death. And you have all of that at the beginning of his ministry. Now come back to Luke chapter 3 with me. So there's your baptism. You with me so far? You tracking? Now the next part is incredibly interesting. And you might be saying to yourself, how in the world, Steve, do you make a genealogy incredibly interesting? I've read Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 1. I know how numbers works. That's where all good Bible reading plans go to die. You go, you get into 1 Chronicles 1, and you're like, I, I don't even, just let's, just, let's just go elsewhere. Let's go 2 Chronicles. There's probably some good stuff back there. Why in the world would I say that this is an incredibly interesting genealogy? And here's what I want to do for you. I get it, man. Genealogies are tough. Uh, but I want to pull out some points that help us understand why a genealogy is so important to Luke's account. And I want to do it by contrasting genealogies. John's gospel doesn't have a genealogy. John's gospel in John chapter one gives you the theology of Christmas. It gives you the theology of in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That's how John begins. He goes into eternity past and the beginning of all creation. But to do this, let's, let's do some Bible work here. You're in Luke 3. Let's come back. Let's go back to Mark chapter 1. I'll show you the easiest genealogy to understand. Look at Mark chapter 1 with me. Y'all there? Here's the shortest genealogy. These are the easiest genealogies to read. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Boom, that's it. There's the whole genealogy. Who's Jesus? Son of God. That's all you need to know. And then Mark's gospel is like he's at a dead run all the time. He's just, everything happens immediately in Mark's gospel. And that's all he has, it's like all he has time for is to go, who's Jesus? That's Son of God. Let's go, Isaiah. We're moving. Now go back to Matthew chapter 1. Okay, so we won't spend a lot of time on Mark's genealogy. It doesn't really help us with Luke's. But we've got to ask with Luke's genealogy, why is it here? Why is it here now? Why is it in the context of a conversation between John and Jesus and heaven and the spirit coming and heaven opening and the father himself saying something uniquely significant about who this person is? Why is it that Luke would now begin the genealogical story of Jesus? Now look at Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And if you just scan Matthew's genealogy, you see that Matthew's genealogy begins with who? It begins with Abraham. Does it go forward or backward? It goes forward from Abraham, right? Matthew's genealogy is structured a certain kind of way. Three sets of 14 names. You can do the counting on that later. Don't worry about it. 
But it's structured to say something very, very important. So when Matthew begins his genealogy, he tells us as he writes to the Jews about two significant historical Jewish figures, Abraham and David. And he says this person is connected to Abraham and to David. Now, if you're a Jew, is that important? Say yes. Incredibly important to know how Jesus fits into the promises given to Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, and to David, the promises given to him, Israel's one true king. That's really, really important. Now look at Luke's genealogy with me. Flip back. Keep, keep your finger there in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chap Matthew's genealogy is selective. As Luke's may be in places, genealogies don't typically work uh, in the New Testament as naming every single name. Matthew's genealogy goes from Abraham forward. Luke's genealogy goes from Jesus backward. Well, why does he do that? So I want to give you just some, some observations about a genealogy that I think will help us. What's the purpose of a genealogy? Why is it there? And commentators observe, and the same, this is the same purpose over in Matthew, is that a geneal genealogy is there is to validate participation and membership within a group. We're determining. Now, anybody ever done, you ever done Ancestry.com? You ever go back and you try to find out, well, who am I really related to? You ever see the, st the story of the celebrities who go, oh my gosh, I'm related to Al Capone. I'm related to whoever, Right? It seems right now everybody is interested in this. And this would be a significant thing for the Jewish people at the time because they actually had genealogical records. They could tell you what tribe you were from as a Jew. And you know this just intuitively. Anybody grow up in a small town? You grew up in a small town. You know some things about that small town that nobody else knows, don't you? You know some stories about the way we do things round here. <laughs> Amen? So you know that when somebody from out of town comes into your little bitty town, you can tell they ain't from around here. <laughs> they don't do things the way we do things around here. There's all sorts of culture and practices and stories that are associated with people and place. And it almost goes without saying that if you're in, that comes with certain social credibility, right? We know your daddy. We know your granddaddy. You have credibility here because we know your family. So that helps us in understanding a, what a genealogy does for us. So when Matthew gives us a genealogy and he con connects Jesus Christ to Abraham and to David, he's also recognizing that the promises that God has made to these patriarchs have to do with the rights that Jesus has, right? He's got to be connected. You can't have an individual roll up on the scene and go, hey, throw to David's for me without knowing his genealogy. So you have in Matthew the fact that a genealogy also determines rights. It also determines, so many movies are based on this, right? Where you have an individual who doesn't know who he really is until he finds out he's related to a long lost distant king. And now his entire perception about himself and what people see and how he acts begins to change because he recognizes he has a right that he didn't know he had up to that point because of his connection to his ancestors. Well, that's what Matthew does for the Jews. But what's interesting is while David and Abraham are significant figures in Matthew's genealogy, they're just names in Luke's. They don't anchor the genealogy in any sort of particular way. They're not drawn out as significant in any kind of particular way. While Matthew's genealogy is selective, three sets of 14 names, Luke's genealogy gives you 77 different names. And Luke's genealogy starts in the present and goes to the past. Now, watch how he does this here. Verse 23. 
Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, which is the typical Old Testament uh, mark of maturity. Priesthood started at 30. David started ruling at 30. We believe Ezekiel was about 30 when he received his ministry call. So 30 seems to be that, that signal of maturity as he steps in to do the things that God has called him to do. Jesus, when he began his ministry, which tells us how the baptism uh, cuts the ribbon on Jesus' ministry, right? That's what's connected here. Jesus begins his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son as was supposed. Now, the supposed word is interesting for Luke to put right there. That supposed word means to think. Now, that, okay, who cares? It's used 15 times in the New Testament. And the vast majority of times that that word is used, it's used in reference to things, uh, opinions that people have that are wrong. Which is very interesting. Especially as we look at Luke's genealogy. Why in the world would Luke use a term that for the vast majority of its uses, all throughout the scripture, is used to describe people who don't see things correctly? People who don't understand things correctly. People who don't understand the very truth that they ought to understand. And Luke gives it to begin with saying that he's the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli. Now, <clears throat> why would Luke, you with me so far? You okay right now? Are we stuck in genealogical land data? I get it. It's tough. Hang with me. We're, get, we're getting there. Why would Luke give a genealogy of Joseph when it's not really a genealogy of Joseph? Why would Luke do that? And you can compare, you can do this on your own, you can compare Luke's genealogy to Matthew's genealogy and you'll discover that Joseph's dad, as recorded in Luke, is not Heli. It's somebody else. And what you'll find as you go through Luke's genealogy is that the descent in Luke's genealogy when it comes to David's son, in, on one hand, is traced through Solomon and in Luke's genealogy it's traced through Nathan. So there are, there are people who are far smarter than me, who've done a lot more genealogical research than me. But I think, for me, when I read Luke's genealogy, what I think is happening is that Luke is giving us Mary's genealogy. Now, why does that matter? Now, look at Luke's genealogy with me just for a second. I'm not going to read all the names. Somebody asked me, are you going to read all the names? I go, no, I'll let you... Read them in your head so I don't embarrass myself by getting them wrong. But if you would look, and would you agree that Matthew's genealogy, starting with Abraham and giving you David, points to the promises given to Abraham and the regal promises given to David. We okay with that? That we look back in Matthew to prove the fact that Jesus is the Son of God who is the inheritor of the promises. All through Matthew's genealogy, you have a term that's used because Matthew moves from Abraham forward, he consistently uses the term father. What's the consistent term in Luke's genealogy? I know it starts with S. You got to make it around the corner though to get to O-N. It's son, isn't it? Well, didn't we just have something happen in the water with Jesus and the baptism where heaven opened and someone said something about Jesus being the son? So now, as you move into Luke's genealogy, if the point of Luke's genealogy is not to prove the fact that Jesus is the true messianic king, and the statement that heaven itself has just made about Jesus being the one true king over all the nations, both in Psalm 2 and in, in Isaiah 42, then the purpose, I think, of Luke's genealogy is to let us know that Jesus is king over everyone. Now, how does Luke prove that? Well, move your way through the genealogy. 24, 25, son of, son of, son of, son of, son of, verse 38. You all the way down? You get through those names? Look at verse 38. The son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Matthew roots his genealogy in the headwaters of the Jewish people. From the very child of promise that comes from Abraham that began the Jewish nation. Matthew roots his genealogy. Luke takes us all the way back to the garden of God to let us know that Jesus 
is not necessarily, though he is, the inheritor of the regal promises and the very promises of Abraham, but to let us know that Jesus is essentially human. And I don't want to go over that too quick. I don't know how you view who Jesus is, whether you have a tendency to view him as always floating three inches off the ground with long hair and a great cloak and good looks and all that. I think we have a tendency to misunderstand what the scriptures say to us about Jesus, that he is really and truly fully man. He's got real DNA. He's really connected to who we are. Do we ever have any problems that show up because we're humans? Do we have any issues in our lives that come as a result of being humans in a world that is corrupted by sin? And for Luke to take us all the way back to the beginning is to show us that Jesus is connected and concerned to everyone. Jesus understands. How many things did Jesus experience as a human that we experience? He experienced the death of a friend. He experienced being misunderstood by his family. He experienced losing a friend and standing at a graveside. He experienced hatred from people. He experienced being misunderstood. He experienced being weary. He experienced the ache and the longing, just like we do, of life in a sinful world. So when Luke gives us this genealogy and goes, he's the son of, the son of, the son of, the son of Adam, the headwaters of our race, who Acts 17 says that from Adam and Eve come every single person who is in this room. Then for Luke to begin Jesus' public ministry with the affirmation of heaven and then to unite him to the human race is to let us know that he is both fully God and he's fully man. He understands what it means for you to be human because he is human. He understands what it means to walk through life in this sinful world and feel the temptations because he's really and truly descended of Adam. Here's another thing that genealogies do for us. A genealogy is a stark reminder that our ancestors are not here, isn't it? It's a stark, I mean, do you know your great-great-grandparents? But you're here because of them. When you go back up the line, just like Luke is doing for us here, it's reminded that we're all connected, but that now our ancestors, the ones who lived and worked and had kids, are gone. So when Luke takes us all the way back to Adam, he says, what I'm doing is showing you that there is something that haunts every single person in this room. It's the fact that in a hundred years, none of us will be here. There's something that as Jesus is in the water with repentant sinners that we're reminded of by looking at a genealogy that goes all the way back and proves that death bats a thousand. Death has gotten every single one. What do you think the purpose is in Luke's gospel of giving us the command to repent. It's not merely for subjective peace because of the particular shame that we have over our sins in this moment. It's to get right so that when you meet the maker of heaven and earth, you and him would be in right relationship because as far as I can tell, death's coming for all of us, amen? And what's most important about your spiritual life right now today is I don't know if tomorrow some of you in this room won't be here and you'll be face to face with the maker of heaven and earth. Which is why the call to repent needs to be so earnest, needs to be so serious. Because a genealogy shows us that our ancestors aren't here anymore. That death got them. There's one more thing a genealogy shows us though. A genealogy going back to Adam shows responsibility. This is always a tension point in any of the movies with the individual who now begins to recognize who he is. He now realizes that there's a problem that only he can fix. There's a difficulty that only he can handle. 
there's something that happens in the tension of the story that rests on whether or not he will be who he's supposed to be. See, the genealogy shows us that this son inherits, inherits responsibility. That when Adam was alone and perfect, in a perfect place, in perfect relationship, with the perfect rules, he failed. And what we need is someone who has the same intimacy with God that Adam had. We need someone who's faced with the same challenge of obedience that Adam had. We need someone who is perfectly God and perfectly man to take on the battle that you and I face every single day. He alone has the rights, the responsibility, the connection to our essential humanity to be able to take on the responsibility that only he can fix, right? You with me? Amen. Amen. And that brings us back to our setting. Where does this start? Where does this moment of Jesus' ministry start? It starts with the Son of God walking down into the water with repentant sinners, praying, receiving the affirmation of heaven as heaven opens and the skies tear open and the Spirit of God falls and God himself says, you are my beloved Son. What does it tell us about God? Is that the whole Trinity is involved in loving, redeeming sinners. So much so, that one of the Trinity himself will incarnate, come down into this world, experience sin in this world as we have experienced, experience temptation as you and I experience it in this world. And he will take on the world, Satan, sin, and death, and he'll win. Now, you got to come back next week because I'll tell you, it's going to get good when this hero shows up on the scene. But for us, we can never forget the fact that Jesus is fully God and fully man. It's the central tenet of Christianity. Because if he's not fully God, he can't fully take the wrath of God for our sins. If he's not fully man, he can't fully and truly identify with sinful humanity. He's got to be both. He's got to be fully man, fully God. And here are two ways, I think, as we close, that Hebrews captures this for us. Hebrews does this in two places that I think are just great reminders as we consider who Jesus is. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir, the heir of all things through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. We can never forget who Jesus is. We can never forget that he is fully and completely divine. He is fully and completely God. But then Hebrews gives you this in Hebrews chapter 4. Since then we have a great high priest whose path through the heavens... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Isn't that good news? So you got to come back next week and watch Jesus go toe-to-toe with the devil. But before Luke gets there, he lets you know that Jesus is the Son of God by virtue of his connection to Adam and by virtue of being uh, from heaven itself and having the divine commendation of the Father in heaven. Father, as we prepare our hearts for communion, we pray that we will be reminded of what Jesus has done on the cross for us. How good he is to love us and to serve us and to pursue repentant sinners. So Father, we prepare our hearts to partake of the Lord's Supper. We pray that you would bless our time. In Jesus' name, amen.